once a year. Come on, let's give God a great big hand today. We're going to the beach. 22 years of bringing God's love to the city, one person at a time, leading people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. And for 22 years, we've been going to the beach. The very first time we went to the beach was in May of 1999. And uh, we had 49 people go to the beach with us, and we had 50 people in attendance that day. Come on, let's give God a big hand. I remember, I said, where did that one person slip off to? But we lost one along the way, but we had a great time. So for 22 years, we've been having just an awesome time of going to the beach. I want to encourage you to make yourself a part of that. If you have your Bibles today, whether you have it technology or whether you have an old school, actually a hardbound Bible or a paper Bible, I want you to stand with me in the honor of reading God's Word. We do have a City Church app, and I would encourage it to, through your Android phone or through your Apple phone, go to the Play Store or go to your Apple App Store and download the City Church app. It has the notes for today's message in it, and it'll be helpful in you following along. I want you to do something today a little different. We're going to read Galatians 5, 22, and 23 out loud together. Will you join me as we read the Scripture text together? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance. Yeah, you ever get like this word like, what does that mean? I, I know we think we know what it means, but sometimes I've found that we find a word like this, we're not quite sure, we just figure we don't have to practice that one, right? No, just kidding, come on. Forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Against such there is no law. Today I'm gonna talk to you on this topic, on this idea, practicing, living a life of self-control. Will you pray with me today? Last week, we prayed for the country of Haiti in our prayer time. Today, we're going to pray for the country of Cuba. Several years ago, I had the privilege with some men from our church of going to Cuba and serving the people and serving the church there. And I heard the cry of those people's hearts. They want freedom. And there's a desperate cry for freedom coming from the country of Cuba today. 90 miles south of the United States' farthest tip point in Key West, there's a country there. There's a group of people that are living under the tyranny, under the oppression, under the bondage of communism today. And I got to tell you, folks, they want to be free. And there's a cry coming out. And I want you to know that God hears the cry of their heart today. And we're going to join alongside with our brothers and sisters in that country. The church is alive there. The church is passionate there. And we're going to pray for their freedom. We're also going to pray for our president. We're going to pray for our United States Senate and our Congress that they would take the right course of actions and the right steps to help those people live free. Will you join with me as we pray for the country of Cuba today? Father, we thank you today for the work of your spirit Holy Spirit, we thank you that over these last few weeks as we've done a deep dive in the way that you're working internally inside of us, you're producing good fruit, the, the fruit that produces a life that brings glory and honor to you. We are so grateful today that we live in a country that we can freely preach the gospel, that we can freely share our faith, that we can freely, Lord, uh, uh, be people who live a life who seeks after you and the life that we believe you called us to. But God, we have some friends not too far away, God, who are not do not have that same freedom. God, they don't have the same freedom of religion. They don't have the same freedom of assembly. They don't have the same freedom of speech. And God, we pray today for our brothers and sisters. There's a cry coming from the island of Cuba, a cry of the human heart that says, let us free. Let us live free. And God, we join with them today. We pray for President Biden. We pray for the United States Senate and Congress today that they would take the right appropriate steps to enable those people to break free from the tyranny and the oppression of this wicked government. God, I ask right now for the Holy Spirit's power to intervene and to answer are the cries of those people's hearts. God, as a local church today, we're not politics. We're about Jesus today. But we know today that you move the hearts and the hands of kings. So I pray today, like you've done in the past, I pray that you do it again. Cut, tear down those walls. Tear down those walls of oppression. And God, right now, as a local church, we come into an agreement today, and we pray the blessing of the Holy Spirit into the heart and life of every single person that's here today. Jesus, I ask this in your wonderful and your mighty name and everyone said amen you may be seated today 
I was 19 years of age. I was living with my best friend in Tucson, Arizona, and I had moved into a house that his dad owned, and, and the three of us had lived in this house, and in the backyard of this house, there was a great big tree. It was very hot in, in, in Tucson. There's a lot of cactus. aren't necessarily a lot of trees, but there was a great big tree in this backyard. I really didn't know what kind of tree. Never paid much attention to it, but one day I was standing in the kitchen, and I looked out the window, and I saw some green things and some purple things hanging off this tree. Had no idea what they were. Had no idea what they were. So I walked out to the tree. I looked up, and I saw this fruit hanging from the tree. And I thought, I, I've had figs before. My mama, you know, my mom was an, a child abuser. She made, my, she made me eat my mashed potatoes and peas before I left the table. You know what I mean? I mean, I had a mom that made us eat all kinds of foods that we didn't like. And we tried all kinds of fruits and all kinds of vegetables. And, and, and so I knew what a fig was. And I said, I'm going to go up and try one of those figs to see if they're ripe. So I climbed up the tree, and I grabbed this really purple fig, and I began to eat it, and it was so sweet. It was so tasty. I was like, this is one of the most amazing fruits. Outside of a mango, this is one of the most amazing fruits I've ever had. I was eating that fig, and I said, wow, well, there's another ripe purple one, and I ate another one, and I live under the philosophy of one is good, one is good, 10 is better. <laughs> and I ate another one. I had another. I had no thought. I, I had no understanding of what figs would do to you if you ate enough of them. And I ate enough. I ate another one. And I ate another one. And I had another one. And before you knew it, I had a fig kind of day. <laughs> That was the rest of my day, folks. The rest of my day was getting rid of figs that I had just eaten a whole bunch of. In that moment, I learned that self-control. Self-control was very important in my life. Self-control in our life will determine our happiness. Self-control in our life will determine whether we succeed or fail in almost every single dimension or reality that you can think of in your human experience. In the Greek, self-control, there's a Greek word here. I'm not going to try to pronounce it because I'll butcher it right now. But the definition of self-control in the Greek is physical and emotional self-mastery particularly in situations of intense provocation or temptation. Did you hear that today? Self-mastery, particularly in situations of intense provocation or temptation. All of us in this room understand that this is the great battle of our life. It's a great battle of our life in every single area. I came across a couple of memes this week that I thought were kind of funny. How many of you have an Alexa in your home? Anybody have an Alexa in your home? Okay, a few of you guys have an Alexa. We have Alexa. We're always telling Alexa to do everything. And, but I forgot we don't have Alexa hooked up to the coffee pot yet, so she can't make my coffee. But she can do a bunch of things in our house. And we use it for timers and all kinds of fun stuff like that. And I came across this meme. Could you put that meme up for me? I, I, I looked in the mirror and I said, Alexa, delete my belly. <laughs> How about this one here? You ever been to a Mexican restaurant before? You never know how much self-control you have until they place chips and salsa in front of you at the Mexican restaurant. Come on now, come on. Right? You go into a Mexican restaurant, they give you a menu, they bring out chips and salsa, and, the, and you ask for another one, they give you another one, you make your order, and they bring you another one, and then you eat that down. And then, but by the time they, they bring your meal, you're like, go ahead and bring me a box. <laughs> Right? We've all had that experience, right? Self-control. Self-control, walking in step of the Holy Spirit. Over the last three or four weeks, we've been talking about a self-controlled life or a surrendered life to the person and work of the Holy Spirit and how fruit, how the fruit he develops is in, in us is a direct relationship and direct relation to our experience and our walk with him. Paul the Apostle told the church at Corinth, he said, everyone who competes in the games exercises, everyone who competes exercises self-control. All of us in this room have to make choices. All of us in this room make decisions about our life. The question for you and I today is who leading me? Is self leading me? Am I the captain of my own ship? Am I the director of my own course? Or is Christ leading me? Is the Holy Spirit leading me today? You see, you could be a believer today and not have a life completely surrendered to the Holy Spirit. 
All of us have areas of our life of self-mastery that the Holy Spirit is still working into us. All of us have areas of our life that we know that he wants to change. We sense it uh, this week as I began to repair. I knew this last week, I was, a week ago, but I knew this last week that I was speaking on. And I told my son, isn't it amazing that when I get ready to preach on a topic, all the opportunities that God gives me to practice self-control. The fact is, you're going to hear this message, and the moment you walk out the doors, you're going to have an opportunity to practice self-control in your life. Self-control is a big deal. Self-control determines whether we succeed or whether we win. Someone once said, I don't have problems with self. It's the control part that's tricky. <laughs> self-control is the foundation of, of the fruit of the spirit of our life. Think about it today. In order for you to truly love someone, you have to practice self-control. There are, and, and the way that you know that you have love as a fruit in your life is when God puts unlovely people into your sphere of influence. <laughs> Because listen, it's easy to love your child. It's easy to love the person who loves you. It's very difficult to love the person of the other political party. It's, come on now. It's very difficult to love a person who thinks bad things about you, your neighbor, your coworker. It's difficult to love people who are unlovely. And the way that you know you have love is when the Holy Spirit is working in you and you know that you love that individual. It takes self-control to be patient with your child who spilled their milk on the dining room table for the fourth time that week. It takes self-control. It takes self-control to be good when you want to be bad. It takes self-control. It takes self-control because self-control is the foundation of all that the Holy Spirit wants to do in and through you and I today. Self-control is the greatest determining factor in your life if you're going to live a happy, successful Christian life. Wouldn't you agree today that self-control, self-control is the biggest challenge of your life? Wouldn't you agree today that there's some area of your life that you haven't completely mastered? Wouldn't you agree today that you need the help of the Holy Spirit? Wouldn't you agree today? Once you agree today that when you look in the mirror today, you see who your real enemy is? Sometimes we want to blame circumstances. We want to blame situations. We want to blame the, the things that are happening out there. But the reality today, it's always about what's happening inside of here. The greatest challenge that you have, the greatest challenge that I have in my life today in walking out a life of self-control is myself. There was a test done in the 1960s, early 1960s. It's called the marshmallow test. It's a very famous test. You can study the test. You can Google online. It's, there's been lots of reviews, lots of conversations, lots of books written around this test that was given in 1960. But in 1960, a, a group of psychiatrists called in 250 or 300 four- and five-year-olds. And they gave them one simple test. They brought them into the room. They put them on a chair, and they put one marshmallow on their leg, one marshmallow. And they explained to them that, listen, we're going to leave the room, and in a few minutes, we're going to come back. And if the marshmallow is still on your leg, when we come back, we're going to give you two marshmallows. And, and so they had the camera set up, and the individual that was doing the test got up, and they walked out, and they show these images of these kids. And I mean, some kids are fidgeting. Some kids are like, they're like looking at it. They're staring at it. They're playing around with it. And, and other kids, they just immediately, they, as soon as the person walks out of the, out of the room, they just grab that marshmallow and eat it. But there were a couple of the kids, there were a few of the kids that were able to practice self-discipline, and they were able not to eat the marshmallow until the person came back into the room. Interesting, right? Interesting study. Well, that wasn't really the study. What they did was they tracked these 275 children. They tracked these children for 40 years. For, after 40 years, they evaluated the, these now adults' lives, and by every metric they had, they found that the children who were able to practice self-mastery or self-discipline, to wait for the individual to come back into the room to give them another marshmallow, they found that those children, by every metric they had, were more successful in all of life. They're more successful in their relationships. They're more successful in school. They're more successful in managing their money. All the different metrics that you would base a successful life by, they found that they were more successful. That's interesting. Here's the point. 
Here, here's the point of the story. Uh, the point with the, uh, the other part of the, st- the, the study that, that they would reveal that there were two things that were taking place. There were children in this room who had, who had been uh, treated in such a way. There were children in this study that had, had been rewarded in a positive way. They had consistent discipline. They had consistent parents who would, who would when they said something, they would do it in their life. And then they have individuals in their life who were unfaithful. As a matter of fact, they take this, took the same group of kids and they tried a test on them. They had one just random group of kids and they told them they were going to do something and then they didn't do it. They said, if you wait here and you, you take this crayon and you hold on to this crayon, we come back we're gonna, and you don't color on the page, we're going to give you a great big box of crayons. Other kids, the same, those same kids, the person would leave. Didn't matter who the kid was. The, the, the teacher would leave or the person would leave. And they would come back and the ch- they would not come back. And the child would just sit there and wait and wait and wait. But another group of kids, they would tell them the exact same thing. And when they came back, they came back, they found that that group consistently, that group consistently did better than the other kids. You see, there's something that happens. There's a, there's a reward mechanism. There's something in our minds, in our hearts, in our spirits that respond to positive enforcement, that, that respond to being people being reliable in our life. But ultimately, ultimately what this shows us is that every single person in this room, every single person in this room has the power by the Holy Spirit to change within them. In other words, they have the ability to make decisions and control their behavior. Uh, What gives me hope today, whether I'm a four-year-old, a five-year-old, a six-year-old, a 60 year old or an 80-year-old in this room today, every person has the ability by the power of the Holy Spirit to make decisions that will radically alter their life for good. You are not powerless today. Sometimes we look in the mirror and we say, oh, poor me, and oh, poor my, and I've made too many mistakes, and I can't change. I want you to know today when you look in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is inside of you, and this is what he says about you. You can change. You can be different. The Holy Spirit Spirit says, I love you. I'm with you. I'm for you. Listen, we've said this all along in this series. Come on, let's give God a great big hand. He is your helper today. The Holy Spirit within every single one of us today enables us to live the life that he's called us to live. But there is a battle. There's a battle today. There's a challenge. Think about it today. Think of all the results, the consequences in our life of not choosing to walk and step with the Spirit and practice self-control. Think of the addictions that are developed, the financial failure that takes place, the obesity, the many diseases, the abuse, the divorce, all these conflicts and tensions, the premature deaths, all these kinds of experiences are a result of a person or a person's not practicing self-control, not learning to master their spirit. See, Paul talks about this war. He gives us this positive, beautiful picture of the work of the Holy Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, or forbearance, long-suffering. You know, he takes this beautiful picture. But just previous to this, he warns us. He warns us. He says, listen, guys, this is what you're going to have to overcome. This is what you're going to have to allow the Holy Spirit to help you to do. The verse is just previous, this talk about the work of the flesh. You see, we have the fruit of the Spirit, and we have the work of the flesh. I've read this text many, many times. I've studied this text many times. And recently, I've been reading through the, the, uh, the Passion Translation. And I found the Passion Translation very helpful in opening my eyes and looking at the Scripture in a new way. I want to just read the previous verses to this. This is the challenge. This is the challenge that lays before us. There are 17 things that Paul lists here. Now listen, this is not, a, not an exhaustive list, but I want you just to look at this list and see if any of these things potentially are something that you might struggle or wrestle through sometime in your life. The behavior of the self-life, the behavior of the self-life is obvious. Sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, pornography, chasing after things instead of God, manipulating others, Hatred of those who get in your way. Senseless arguments. We see any of those on social media today? Come on. Resentment when others are favored. Temper tamper. Angry quarrels. Only thinking of ourselves. Being in love with our own opinions. Being envious of the blessings of others. Murder. Uncontrolled addictions. Wild parties. And other similar kinds of behavior. So this is the challenge. The Holy Spirit is here to help us to live a life of self-control, but we have a battle. 
We have a battle that the Lord has called us to be victors in, to be overcomers in. We're not powerless today. We have his spirit living and dwelling with inside of us. Our emotions today, our emotions today are ruled by the choices that we make, the thoughts that we think, the words that we think, and the actions that we live. Our thoughts that we think, the words that we speak, and the actions that we live. Our thought life. The first thing that we must master if we're going to live, work on mastering. Walk in step with the Holy Spirit to allow him to enable us to win in life is our thoughts. Everyone say thoughts today. Paul the apostle said this to the church of Corinthians. Take captive. Everyone say take captive. Take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. How many of you had a bad thought today? Come on, be honest. How many had like five bad thoughts today? <laughs> I mean, if we're really honest, we realize and we recognize we have bad thoughts that flood through our mind. Bad thoughts are not what are sin. The sin comes when we act upon that bad thought. Listen, Jesus himself had bad thoughts come into his mind. As a matter of fact, everything that Satan tempted Jesus with was true. Do you know that? It wasn't right. It wasn't right. But the words of Satan to Jesus in the desert, they were true words. He quoted the scripture at him. He misquoted. He twisted. But everything he said, listen, just because something true doesn't mean it's right for your life. Just because a thought comes in, it doesn't mean we have to hold it. We can have something that's true about somebody, but it isn't right about somebody. I want you to hear today, learning to take captive our thoughts is one of the most important dimensions of your spiritual walk with God that you must learn to submit to the Holy Spirit because everyone, everyone in this room, everyone in this room will wrestle through this area. Thoughts flooding through our mind. Our thoughts are shaped and directed by the things that we hear, the things that we watch, the things that we experience. We must learn to submit those things to the work of the Spirit of God. See, our thoughts today must not be shaped by the things that we hear, the things that we say. Our thoughts today, must, we must learn to develop them. We must learn to develop them by the power of the Spirit through his word. You see, when Jesus overcame bad thoughts in his life, he always used the word of God. Last year, I went on this plan. I, I went on this very strict Weight Watchers plan. I was going to lose a certain amount of weight in a certain amount of time. And, and, and I remember the very first night, the very first night I went on this Weight Watcher plan, I, I went to this beautiful dinner. It was hosted by this group. And, and, man, it was just lovely. And they kept serving course after course after course. And at the very end, they gave every person not just one dessert, but they gave us two desserts. And I remember thinking, get behind me, Satan. I mean, you're like, you can't believe it. Every time you set yourself. You see, the fact is today, the only way that you're able to overcome the battleground that's taking place in your mind, and it is a battle. You see, your life is won and lost, not out there. You're, you're, the battleground is not won in your pocketbook. The battleground is not won by some doctor out there. The battleground in your life, whatever is happening right now, always starts right here. It always starts in your thoughts, thinking God kind of thoughts. Philippians chapter 4, Paul would say it like this. Whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are a good report, think on these things. Our thoughts must be shaped it's why we've been talking through this whole series about the necessity and the importance for you to have personal time with God and the Word. You have your own Bible study plan. You opening up your phone and you downloading the app, the Bible app, and it's so easy to find. And, and you go on there and they got plans every day of the week, man. But I want to challenge you today. Allow God to replace your negative thoughts, your unbelieving thoughts, your filthy thoughts, your fearful thoughts. Allow God's word to begin to transform you from the inside out. You see, because the, your thoughts today will determine the course of your life. The proverb says it like this, as a man or woman thinks in his heart or her heart, so are they. You are today the sum total the actions, the words that you speak are a direct result of the thoughts that you've allowed to remunerate and go over in your mind, in your spirit, in your heart. 
It's why the psalmist David would cry out, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O God. Let your words, let my meditation be acceptable in your sight, O God. Our thoughts today, our thoughts today. See, our thoughts always lead to our words. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 37, by your words you will either be acquitted or by your words you will be condemned. Your words, your words are direct overflow of what's inside of your heart. What's inside of your heart is a direct result of what you've been listening to, what you've been reading, what you've been thinking about, who you've been hanging around with. Someone once said they made a mistake in something. They said it was a Freudian slip. And I always said, everything that I've said, I might not wanted you to hear it, but I meant to probably say it. <laughs> I mean, the fact is all of us have said things that we wish we wouldn't have said. We wish that we could take back. But the only way that we can have right words flowing in our heart is if we have uh, out of our mouth is we have right things going into our heart. You see, our, out of the abundance of our mouth, out of abundance of our heart, our mind, our thoughts, our mouth speaks. What you put inside. My mama used to always say, garbage in, garbage out. What you're watching on YouTube, what you're watching on Netflix, what you're reading in the newspaper, on your online stories, what you're, what you're meditating, thinking about on your Instagram, your TikToks, what you're th all those kinds of things have a direct impact on what's going to come out of your mouth. You've been thinking about it. You've been meditating on it. And so the challenge for you and I today, the challenge for you and I to, is to let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable and pleasing to our God. See, our words today will bring life or bring death. Bring life or bring death. You can be with a group of people, and all of a sudden, one person starts to get really negative, and prayerfully, it's not you, but they start speaking really negatively. And you can see either life go into that room or you can see death go into that room. See, words have power. Your words have power to them. They have the power to influence. They have to not only influence yourself, but to influence the people who are around you. In your home today, come on, you know in your home today, there's a little terse, there's a, there's a little frustration between the husband and wife, then the child walks into the room, and all of a sudden, the child gets barked at. Then the child goes and hangs out with brother or sister, and all of a sudden, the whole house is quarreling. Why? Because words have taken life. Words have created a, a spirit of negativity and frustration and anger in the home. So we must learn to master our words today. Your best relationships in life are a direct result of the words that you speak. Think about it today. The words that you speak, the way that you speak to your child, the way that you speak to your friends, the way that you speak to your spouse, your very best relationships in your life will be directly as a result of the words that you speak today. You know, your words can never be taken back. Your words can never be taken back. What we say today will be quoted. What you say today to your kids will someday be quoted. What you, what you say today potentially will someday be quoted to your grandchildren. Your words today, your words today have impact, impact on your family. Our words today produce life. Our words today produce death. I looked at this. I looked at this relationship that we have with our thoughts and our words because they always lead to our actions. The proverb says even a small child is known by their actions. See, the actions that you create define your life. C.S. Lewis once said, it is when our, we are at our worst that our character is defined, that we behave when, we, when we're inconvenienced, wronged, angered, or slandered, or liable. We, build, we will be remembered then, and that will defi define our life. The good and the bad and the ugly of every person in this room is that we ultimately are re, will be remembered for the way that we acted and the way that we made people feel. As I've grown in maturity over the years, as I've grown in my relationship with the Lord and influence in the Christian church, I realize the influence that I have in other people. And I realize so many times I'm a type A type of person and I'll walk into a room and man, and I want to get things done and my, why, why did this happen? And I, I, Before I walk into this building every single day, I'm out my truck, I'll say, put your smile on. Put your smile on. Make sure you go around and you greet every, before you start leading and giving directions and telling people or fixing this or doing that, make sure that you greet them. Good morning. 
You're sending a text to somebody, and they, they fire a text off at you. Maybe it's a little terse, or, you know, they're asking where something's at, and you immediately want to respond back. It's your first communication of the day with that individual. Just don't fire back a quick response. You know what you do? You say, good morning, good afternoon. Put a little smiley face there. Uh, the, the, the fact is, the way that we act towards other people will be remembered today. Everything we say, everything we do, and every way that we act People remember us for the kind of person that we were in the most difficult moments of our life. Several years ago, one of the men of our church passed away suddenly. He was a lieutenant in the police department of Castleberry, and it was a shock to all of us. He went into the hospital, kind of had this weird thing happen. He was in his early 50s and got sick one day and couldn't get over it. And that night, they went into the hospital, and in the middle of the night, he passed away. It was a great shock to our church. I remember, I remember his wife, her name was Norma. I mean, I don't know about you, man, but that would just, I mean, it's one thing to be alongside and walk through some with long-term illness, but when your spouse of 30 years and many kids, when they, when they just suddenly go like that, it's a shock. And it was a shock to us as a congregation. And I remember I ran down to the hospital and she was, had already left and I finally caught up with her and I just watched her in those moments. And I watched her in that immediate moment when she first heard and her reaction and the way she just literally leaned into God. And she had all of her kids around her. She was a strong one in the family. And then I watched as we walked through all the funeral preparations and just the way she poised herself. And then they brought Dennis's body. We were over airport campus. And they brought Dennis's body and they, they, uh, they placed it up in the front. They have, I don't, know, I don't know what they call that. It's like a state of affairs almost. And for 24 hours, they had police officers stationed around that building. And they had his body. And I mean, for 24 hours, people would come in and out. And they would have a viewing of his body. And I remember she stood there. That Miss Norma, she stood there by her husband's body. I mean, she stood and she greeted every single person. It was just amazing. And my, my whole life, I, I always had great respect for this woman, but my respect for this, for that woman, just went all the way through the roof. I'll always remember her. I'll always remember her for the way that she acted in the moment of intense trial. And it was a great trial. You'll be remembered for the way that you act. See, a lack of self-control in any area of our lives cheats us from God's very best. Whatever your struggle, whatever temptation, whatever area you've not been able to master and overcome, I want you to know today, it cheats you from God's very best in your life. So what about you today? What is, what is robbing you of God's best? What is robbing you of God's best? I want to give you just a couple simple things today. A couple simple things that I think are going to really help you as you leave today. My dad, the first time he heard me preach, and I was just rambling on and preaching and wandering. And my dad afterwards came up to me, son, I got four letters for you. Keep it simple, sweetie. <laughs> I'm going to keep it really simple. The first thing is acknowledge and recognize you need the Holy Spirit's help. Just acknowledge that. You can't do this on your own. We have Celebrate Recovery here at City Church. We have a group of men that come from the Teen Challenge. We have a group of men that come from the Recovery, recovery House. We have the Angel of Mercy, the women that come uh, to the second service. We have all these different groups. And I got to tell you, they do a lot of behavioral modification techniques and things to try to help people overcome addictions. But what I have discovered is that those things on their own will leave people a victim, will leave themselves just on their own, without the Holy Spirit's power, without the Holy Spirit's help, will never walk into the realm of victory. You see, God wants you to live victorious today. See, we're, we're just human beings, and we desire to give good gifts to our children. Jesus said, you've been evil. How much more does he desire to give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? When you're going through the struggle, when you're battling thoughts, Holy Spirit, help me in my thoughts today. Holy Spirit. When you're, being, when you're being challenged and you're being tempted in the words and the things that you're going to say and things are starting to get emotional on the job or starting to get emotional in your relationship with your spouse or starting at some other context, driving it, whatever it is, Holy Spirit, help me to control. Put a seal upon my lips. Help me, Lord. Help me to control my text, Lord. <laughs> help me, Lord. Holy Spirit, help me. Help me, Lord, in my actions today. Help me to be a person that reflects you and honors you everywhere I go and everything I say and everything I do. Not always, it's not easy. This is the continual dying to our own human self, to the self-life and living the God life. 
The second thing is you must embrace your new identity. Do you know who you are in Christ today? Do you understand who you are in Christ today? Christ lives inside of us. I love this passage in Colossians in the, in the Passion Translation. For he is the complete, he being Jesus, is the complete fullness of deity living in human form. Jesus is God, is God with human skin on. Listen to me, hear me today. Read the rest of the verse. And our own completeness, your completeness, my completeness, is now found in him. We are completely filled with God as Christ's fullness, Christ's fullness overflows within you and I. Our completeness is found in him. You're a new person. You're a new identity. You've been given a new name. <laughs> yeah, people identify with all kinds of things in our culture today. People identify with all kinds of people groups. We're, we're very tribal as human beings. We identify with political parties. We identify with our race or with our culture. We identify with all these different kinds of things. But I want you to know today as a believer, you know who you are? You're a child of God. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. Come on, I want you, let's give God a great big hand today. Completely filled with God. Are you allow him to flow out of your life today? The last thing. See, God's, God is in you. He's working in you. But here's your part. You got to remove the temptations. You got to remove the temptations. Look, look what Paul here, says here to the church, to, to Timothy. He says, Timothy, flee from youthful passions. Flee. Flee. Run from. Think twice before you send that text. Think three times before you put that post on Facebook, Instagram, some social media platform. Flee from youthful passions. But you don't just flee from something. You run to something else. You follow after something else. You follow after the heart of God. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Follow after these things. Run after these things. Go after these things. Go after a life of love. Go after a life of faith. Go after a life of love. Fight together. Fight together with those who call on the Lord of a pure heart. It's why you need other people. It's why you need to go to church on Sunday. It's why you need to be in a small group. It's why you need to be in a Zoom. If you can't be in a small group in person, be in a Zoom group. You need other people in your life. If you're going to win, if you're going to overcome, if you're going to allow the Holy Spirit to work in you and work out of you so that you can live a happy, fulfilled, successful Christian life, let me tell you today, you got to do this one thing. All these other things, this one thing has to happen. You got to get your motivation right. You got to get your motivation right. Why, why do you want to lose weight today? Is so that you can look sexy in that new outfit you just put on? Why do you want to be the biggest man in the room or have the biggest bank account? All those motivation things is what God wants to deal with in our heart today. Get your motivation right. Get your motivation right. These words... These words resonate in my heart today because there's one thing that Paul desired and there's one thing that will enable you to live a life of self-control and that is knowing Christ. Says Paul says, I continually want to know the wonders of Jesus and to experience the overflowing power of his resurrection working within me. I want to know Jesus. I want to know Jesus. The wonders of our Savior. He was tempted in all points, yet he never sinned. I want to know that God. I want to walk with that God. I want to allow that God to live and to work through my life today. How about you? Will you close your eyes? What in your life is cheating you out of God's best? It's a good question. What in your life is cheating you out of God's best? Anyone to be, want to be honest today? Say, Pastor, I need the Holy Spirit to help me. I got some areas in my life, man, it's really struggles here. Maybe it's, maybe it's things that you're saying, it's things you're doing. Maybe it's your thought life today. Maybe it's somebody in the room just, you're constantly bombarded with bad thoughts, wrong thoughts. You know they're not right, you just can't seem to overcome them. All of us in this room, struggles of the heart, idols of the heart that we must destroy, that we must allow Christ to rule and reign in. You're here today and say, Pastor, I need the Holy Spirit to help me to live a life of self-control. If that's you in the room, we just raise your hand. Come on, there's no one looking right now. Anyone here today? Come on, all of us in this room, we need the Holy Spirit to help us today. 
Will you stand with me this morning? Our worship team is going to sing this song, Jesus, I Come. I believe all of us in this, I know myself, man, all week long, I've been challenged as I've processed this message. The Lord's allowed me to grow this very week. Opportunities to be tested, to be tempted, to teach me that I need Him. And as we worship in this next song, you've raised your hand, you didn't raise your hand, I want you to allow this to be a moment to ask yourself the question, is there anything in my life that's cheating me from God's very best? Let's worship the Lord as we sing today.